when we're talking about knowledge, one of the first things that we want to do is make sure that we're all using the word in approximately the same sense. So what do we mean by knowledge? What's the connection of that to certainty? You know, do we really know things? David, why don't you start us off? Okay, thank you very much. Well, I'm inclined to think there are a lot of different ways of making sense of the world of experience and that certain questions are perhaps more appropriate for certain ways of understanding the world than others. So, of course, we venerate science as one way to learn about the world of experience, but not every question is a scientific question. So, for instance, one might wonder, is the Earth round? And there's a, a famous story about how Aristotle was able to perceive this, uh, that the eclipses of the, the moon were caused by the Earth's shadow. He noticed that the hulls of ships uh, sort of disappeared before the rest of the ship, and that led him to conclude that the Earth was spherical. Uh, in the many years since, of course, we've learned lots of other ways of um, better refining our understanding of the fact that the, the Earth is a globe. Um, so what, to my mind, this illustrates is that uh, scientists have systematic ways in which they try to collect information about the world and test their ideas and come up not with the truth, but rather with what seems to fit both the available evidence and our interpretive frameworks. And the thing to keep in mind when it comes to scientific claims is that oftentimes our interpretive framework can change, and as a result, that can lead to a change in our, our whole worldview about what we uh, previously regarded as knowledge and not. I'll point out that if we go into this thinking that every other way of learning about the world has to conform to the standards of science, we're going to be disappointed. And I don't think anyone who thinks that there's another way to understand the world in terms of a religious perspective or an artistic perspective should feel the need to somehow meet the standards of science. And of course, there are certain questions that I think call out for an explanation from something other than science. So for instance, one might ask, what does it mean to be human? I suppose from a scientific standpoint, as a biologist, I would say, well, it means that you belong to a particular species. Um, and that, to my mind, is a wholly unsatisfying answer. <laughs> if you asked an astrophysicist, he or she might draw attention to the fact that in the grand scheme of things, given cosmic uh, time um, and, and um, sizes, that we're nothing, that life is meaningless. And I, again, find that particularly um, problematic. And so I'm inclined to think that there are ways of understanding the world that perhaps are informed by still other perspectives. And it would be an impoverished world, and, um, truly, if we restricted ourselves to a scientific perspective. Yeah, thank you, David. First of all, let me just say thanks again for all of you. I, I can imagine other things you, you might want to be doing on a Friday evening. So that you have uh, joined us here is, is, is really neat. Um, and, and I have my phone out here, not because I'm checking the time. Um, there are a few quotes that I thought I might share at some point during this conversation. And I wanted to make sure I didn't butcher them. So they're in front of me here. Um, sometimes, you know, when we ask weighty questions like this, I feel like our initial answers are often inadequate because we have our blinders on. Right? So we're thinking about it from the perspective of the work that we're doing, or the language that we speak, or the culture that we're in. And for a question like knowledge, that, I, I think that's necessarily limiting. Right? It's constraining. And it prevents us from really maybe having a more holistic view of what that uh, word means, or what it means to know. So one of the things I like to do uh, when people ask me a question like that is to look across cultures, look across languages, look across time. Um, and I think when we do that here, there's really interesting ideas that emerge. So let me, let me give you one example. If you go to Sanskrit, which is the ancient uh, language of India, um, where I come from, um, there, there are actually two main words for knowledge. There are actually some more, but grossly speaking, two words. One is more about like observing something in your space to see is actually what the verb really means, but has come to be interpreted as knowledge. So that's kind of observing and, and recognizing facts around you. And then there's a, a word for knowledge that's much more about an insight 
or a piece of wisdom that you might have gained about the way the world works that isn't necessarily an observable fact per se. Right? So I find that interesting. Then you go to Italian and there are at least two verbs for to know. One is sapere, which is kind of, again, more like a, a knowledge or about a fact. And then conoscere, which is like knowing someone, having an intimate and personal relationship with someone. I find it really intriguing that they've distinguished those two things, right? That knowing someone and everything that comes with that, um, that's different than observing something around you or stating a fact about how a rock looks or, or whatever. Um, in, in Hebrew, uh, you may find the word yada for knowledge, but it's, if you look in, in the Bible or in many other non-biblical texts that use ancient Hebrew, um, the, the, the way to interpret that depends on the context. And yet again, you see that sometimes it's used about a very obvious discernible fact of something around you or a really deep and profound relationship. Like for example, in, in, in the Old Testament where it talks about God knowing us, it's like this deep and profound and like almost unsearchable kind of intimacy, right? So I think what that tells us is that there, there are different kinds of knowledge. Many cultures and peoples have recognized this and you see that in the way that their languages have developed and evolved. And so it, just to kind of round that out, I might say that, that broadly there's propositional knowledge, which means things, you know, observable facts. Right? Um, this, you know, these chairs are, actually I don't know, what color is this? Orange, reddish, right? whatever, whatever it is, um, versus an experiential knowledge, right? The knowledge that comes from experiencing something. Um, I gave you the example of experiencing a person, and as you develop a relationship with them, the kind of intimacy that evolves, you know that person, right? But not, not in a way that's sort of scientifically provable or you, know, you can sort of lay out the, the logical steps for how you got to the knowledge of them but you know them, right? So, um, yeah, I think there are different ways of knowing, and maybe I'll leave it there and, you know. Okay, well, that kind of moves us into a second big question, which I'll just uh, adapt off of here. David, do you want to... We're not going to respond to one another? Oh, do you want to? Yeah, go. Yeah, take yeah, take the mic. Go, go. Yeah, uh, I, I just want to draw attention to something. I've been thinking about this quite a bit of late, is that there are things that different forms of knowledge have in common, and one in particular that I think we're we're all inclined to think is that there's an intersubjective component to it, which is to say, um, in science, we have this formal process known as peer review by which claims are established. And to my mind, it's hubris on the part of anyone to think that, in point of fact, there aren't standardized ways in which artists, um, biblical scholars, establish the claims that they make. And so I think, to some extent, there is this sense that the production of knowledge is something that a community does. And to my mind, that might give us some insights into what these different forms of knowledge have in common with one another. Yeah, actually, you yeah, got riff off of that for a minute. Um, you, when you said community, one of the things I really like to do in community is music, listen to music, actually. Um, and it reminded me of, so David Livingstone Smith, he's a, a philosopher at the University of New England, um, and I just came across a, a, something that he wrote in his blog or something, but it was called Music as a Way of Knowing. And um, I've often thought about this myself. I'm a scientist, but music is really what makes me tick. I love music. Deep down, that's really what drives me. Um, I can't even play an instrument, but it's just, you know, and as a person of faith, uh, nothing more than music has made me feel the presence of God. So it's, music is really powerful for me. Um, and I'll just give you this, music as a way of knowing is deeply personal for me because I remember when I was in high school, I read a Cliff Notes bullet point summary version of Les Miserables, Victor Hugo's, you know, opus. And I thought I knew the story. And, and I did know the main highlights of the story, right? And sort of the, the logical flow of it and what happened and what, how people have interpreted it in history and all these things. So I kind of knew it, right? Then I listened to a soundtrack for the, the musical. 
And it not only blew me away and moved me emotionally, I actually walked out of that experience listening to that in community and in talking with others about that shared experience, feeling philosophically enlightened, actually feeling like I know something now, right? It's sort of this like, um, like a deeper feature, like a higher order, deeper feature of the world. We all experience it, I feel like, with things that we really strongly resonate with. We don't know how to quite put it in words, and it's certainly not scientifically provable per se, but we really feel like we connected with something, and, and we know it. We know something about the world, and I certainly knew the story of Les Mis so much better listening to that soundtrack than, than just reading the logical flow of the story, right? Um, which again kind of speaks to these different ways of knowing. All right, let's uh, pick up with that and <clears throat> let's also try to get the microphone working properly. And, let, you know, what we've heard already, I think both of our speakers are telling us that although there are methods that we use in the sciences, those aren't the only things. So instead of just reading the next question off the list, I'm going to adapt it a little bit. So. When we go through life, sometimes we're trying to find out facts, sometimes we're looking for propositional knowledge, sometimes we're wrestling with frameworks, big scale interpretive matrices that we use for figuring out what specific facts mean, why they're relevant, what we ought to do with them. Um, when we wrestle with some of those broader questions, is there any sense in which we do that scientifically, or would that really be a category mistake? Where, you know, where do we go for those kinds of things? David, why don't you? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll give you just one example where I think this becomes poignant. Um, there are some people who, when they think about our understanding of the world from a religious standpoint, restrict their attention to biblical scholars. And when they do so, I think to some extent, they're drawing our attention to the fact that archaeological discoveries, uh, discoveries by people who study ancient Greek can inform our reading of the Bible and how to interpret it. But I think for the vast majority of Christians, making sense of the Bible is a deeply personal thing that one does in a far more subjective, which is not a pejorative word, but a subjective interface where you think of the Bible as a living document and it speaks to you and you get insights from doing that regardless of what these academic discussions are. And so to my mind, there are points in almost any discipline where one can talk about how the impacts of, for instance, uh, a scientific study of, of how light travels and how it impinges with our eye uh, in terms of how we're able to see visual things might impact the aesthetic experience. But that doesn't diminish the fact that when you go to an art gallery, and you experience great art, at least in your opinion, um, you have a, an experience that I think is unique and powerful, and I don't think that it should be minimized by the fact that it isn't necessarily the product of some scientific or quasi-scientific procedure. Yeah, and it, um, oh, you can really hear me now. Um, Connected, my thoughts on this are connected a little bit to something you asked in the, early, in the first question, Tim, that I'm, I'm remembering maybe we didn't touch on as much, and that is, can we be certain? Right? Can we be sure in, in this uh, endeavor or this effort to try to gain knowledge uh, about something? Um, I actually think certainty and, and sureness is, um, it, it's, it's really cracked up to be a lot when it is not as much. In fact, I think it's actually crippling for us. Uh, this notion that we can be sure or that we can be certain. Um, there's this uh, really wonderful book that was very influential for me. It's called The Myth of Certainty. Um, and it was written by a professor at Hope College. Um, who is a, He's a, a devout Christian himself. But he writes this book called The Myth of Certainty um, because he, he finds that premature commitment, right, often leads to all kinds of uh, problems and confusions, um, and more than anything else, it stalls us on what he calls the journey to knowledge. Um, and, and so putting it in that framework, knowledge isn't something you just gain and then you're done with and you move on. It's this sort of constant 
refining. It's a journey, um, which again puts it more into relational terms. I mean, I, I've been married to my wife for 18 years. Um, and um, yeah, I know her really well. <laughs> there are still things I'm learning about her, right? So, and, and I don't think I'll be done doing that um, un, un, until I'm no longer here. Um, and so no, knowledge is a journey, even, even my scientific work. Um, you know, just when we think, I mean, I've been staring at parts of the genome for a long time, trying to understand exactly what they do and assign functions to different parts of the genome. But just when I think I've figured it out, right, there will be some new perspective on it. I'll realize, oh, wow, there's context specificity in a different setting, in a different time, in a different way. This part of the genome actually does something else that I hadn't anticipated, right? And it'll surprise me, but it'll add to the body of knowledge that I'm gaining. So whether it's scientific, whether it's propositional, or whether it's experiential, um, we're, it's a journey, right? And to me, you know, when we talk about there being different forms of knowledge, that doesn't mean they're not connected. That doesn't mean that they don't relate or inform one another, right? Even, uh, you know, the, the decision that I made to take a leap of faith and propose to my wife, you know, trusting she would say yes, right? Um, there was quite a bit of propositional knowledge that led to my confidence to do that, right? Years of being together, you know, lines of evidence that suggested she felt the same way, but it was a risk a little bit nonetheless, right? Maybe some of you know what I mean. Um, and um, I'm glad I took that risk, right? Even though I wasn't 100% certain if I'm really honest with myself, right? So there is in, in life, in the pursuit of knowledge, there is, in you know, being inquisitive, asking questions, intellectual curiosity, gaining information. But at the same time, at some point, there's also a call to take a risk to commit. That risk to commit is not so that you can say you're 100% sure, but because that's really where life happens, right? It's in this beautiful kind of interplay between inquisitiveness, asking questions, skepticism, doubt, and also a, an openness to uh, commit. When do you make that kind of commitment? That's really difficult to say. There's no formula, right? And every situation is different. Every question, every context is different, right? But what Daniel Taylor talks a lot about is that you, you do have to have some kind of commitment, a willingness uh, to do that, even, uh, even though you are at the same time skeptical and uh, understanding that certainty is, a, is, is, is maybe not everything it's cracked up to be and not even perhaps possible in most instances. So now I'm gonna press back. I think it's, it's good to, to perhaps present uh, different perspectives on this. I think one of the ways that we can study this question of certitude is with reference to the history of science. Surprise, surprise for, for some of you that I would, uh, I would go there, but um, there are instances in the history of science where things have gone from being tentative to being certain and vice versa. So let me give you one example in which this is the case. Um, way back in the time of the ancient Greeks, they came up with this idea of the atom. And uh, this was romanticized by the ancient Romans in a, a famous uh, poem by Lucretius. And it basically didn't go really anywhere until the time of Dalton. And then it became ever and ever clearer to people that this concept of an atom that no one, you know, they speculated, but we had no reason to believe actually exists, turns out does exist. And in point of fact, the evidence that led scientists to conclude that the atom truly is not merely a theoretical entity, but does exist, has to do with the fact that there are literally 26 different ways to uh, establish uh, the mole, the, the, the number of atoms in a mole in chemistry. Uh, the same thing is true in biology when it comes to the evidence that ultimately convinced people that evolution had taken place. People speculated about it. And it's in Darwin's masterful presentation that he drew attention to multiple lines of evidence that all seem to converge on this claim that life has evolved on this planet over tremendous periods of time to the diversity that we see today. And so to my mind, where we need to have a healthy respect for the possibility that knowledge is not certain in the sense that we know it to be true, we can't 
go to the other extreme and say, well, then it's all a matter of opinion or it's all relative. Scientists, by and large, do distinguish between things that are basically well-established, particularly by multiple lines of evidence, and those things that are less so. And that's a, a sort of good touch um, post for, for other uh, types of, of knowing, to, to recognize that we can make this distinction between those things that we think are fairly well-established and those things that we think are less well-established. Yeah, David, I actually agree. I, th I think we're, we're not saying too different of a thing here. I think part of what I mean is, even if you, who knows Blaise Pascal? Yeah, brilliant logician, mathematician, um, one of the greatest thinkers, scholars, minds um, in history. Um, he wrestled a lot with this question. And by the way, uh, I, I think an aside that's really kind of interesting, sometimes we think that this question is a modern question because we live in this like very scientific age. Uh, it, this isn't a modern question. We, we maybe have, we have a different instance of this question, but back in the day, right, as a response to the Middle Ages was birthed the Enlightenment period, right? The age of reason, right? Which said that, you know, science is really the way to acquire knowledge and be fully human. But then as a response to that came the Romantic period, right? Uh, that said, uh, the artist's law is his, and I would add her, feelings, right? So it's, and it's really in the marriage of those two, right? So there was a period of time where we thought science is the end all be all. And then we came in and thought, well, no, we are reducing our existence to one dimension and to treat everything as though it is just a cold, sterile subject of study that can be reduced to a bunch of logical propositions isn't our experience in life. This isn't making sense to me. And the romantic period came. And the reality is that it's really the marriage of the two that I think you know, brings you to, to higher planes of understanding. Madeline Langle, a really famous uh, American author who wrote a lot about, a lot of fiction on science and, and uh, um, you know, other ways of knowing and faith. Um, she actually goes another step. And then when she said it was scandalous, but she said that intuition and intellect must make love, she said, right? In the true pursuit of knowledge, right? And sometimes th those two, when they come together, you don't know, this is like two becoming one, like you don't know where one starts and the other ends. And that has actually been my experience in the pursuit of knowledge, is really embracing the importance of both of those aspects. Of E.M. Forster's line only connects the prose and the passion Right. A lot of different people from a lot of different vectors have seen that there are these various things that we do as humans and we can't just seal off segments of our lives. So that being said, and I gather that what each of you will say in, in your own ways is that this is a, something of an individual thing to work out, but how do we bring together different ways of knowing, because in the end, you know, I, I'm not the Romantic period and I'm not the Enlightenment. I'm, I'm me, I'm here, I'm now. And I'm, I'm looking at all the different things that pull at my allegiance and claim that I should believe this, follow that, dismiss this other thing as ridiculous. And what, what wisdom would you give to somebody who's trying to navigate all of this? Okay, so I'm gonna tell you a story Way back when, when I was at Iowa State, I was in charge of a class called The Meaning of Life. <laughs> and this was way back when I was a, a philosopher. And what you find out when you do philosophy is that progress per se involves the ever and ever greater sophistication of questions. You don't have a set of, of, of pat answers to give people. And so the point of the course was to acquaint students with literally 20 different perspectives that people have historically taken to what they think the meaning of life should be. And my goal was not for students to have a particular perspective. My goal was to start them on a journey where at the very least they're reflecting upon the answers others have come up with in drawing their own conclusions. And so to my mind, a very important aspect of this is to avoid the assumption that there's one right answer. Now, from a methodological standpoint, of course, this guides a lot of science. So I'm inclined to think in science, we, we tend to think in terms of there's a single reality, 
and we have some things that we're relatively confident about, and then there are other things that perhaps we don't know, but there truly is, if we were presented with two different models that might account for something, there truly is a reason, or there in principle should be, for choosing one over another. And I guess my point is simply that when it comes to questions like, what is the meaning of life, I don't think we should in any way, shape, or form convince ourselves that there's only one way to do it. And then finally, just to go the other side of this, I'm inclined to think there are certain questions that should not, that they might in some sense be informed by a scientific perspective, but, but quite frankly cannot be decided by science. And one of my favorites is whether God exists. I think it's a category mistake to look for evidence for God's existence and to the extent that intelligent design as a movement is an attempt to find some example of irreducible complexity such that you can claim, aha, there's scientific proof God exists, I think is a, a true disservice to people of faith because people of faith do not have to establish their point of view by means of scientific evidence. That, that the trap you should not allow yourself to fall in. It's called a leap of faith for a reason. I, I do agree with that part I, I, very much, actually. Um, to assume, it's hubris indeed, actually, to, to assume that the tools of, of uh, humankind uh, could be used to deduce the infinite. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's, there, there's a categorical issue there. there. There are a couple of thoughts, Tim, that come to mind when you ask that. Uh, one is a simple thing, but I've, I've always found it really profound. John Polkinghorn, who's possibly done more on the, the, the conversation on science and faith and sort of the intersection than maybe anybody I've ever known and read. Um, he was a, a renowned physicist, a British physicist, uh, turned uh, Anglican priest, clergyman. And so he really had perspectives on, 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 on both of these. He, he has this really simple example where he says, let's say a kettle is boiling, right? Uh, water is boiling in a kettle. And someone asks the question, why is the, the kettle boiling? Right? And he said, well, answer one, right, is that um, the heat, right, is, is making the water boil, and here's how this works, and here's the chemistry, right? And uh, answer two is, well, I wanted a cup of tea, right? Um, th these are both true, right? Uh, but they're true on, on different planes, right? And they, they don't uh, negate one another, right? They're not in opposition to one another. They exist on different dimensions as a, as a real answer, a true answer to why is the kettle boiling, right? And, and John used this example to try to convey his message of how science is often interested in how. What is the mechanistic basis for X, Y, Z phenomena, right? Whereas the, you know, I wanted a cup of tea, right? That vein is more interested in why, right? And generally we need to appreciate that science is agnostic with respect to the why, right? It, it doesn't mean that that's not an important or interesting question, quite to the contrary. It's just that the scientific tools are not really perhaps the ones to be using in, in addressing uh, those, those types of questions. But they, they, but they can connect. But they can connect because they both contribute to our understanding of what's happening right now. I want a cup of tea, but I don't know how to get the water to boil, then maybe I have a scientific problem? Exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's see if we've got a little bit more time to explore this. I, I had a lovely conversation with these gentlemen and the student leaders uh, over dinner, and David let go with something that I'm going to come back. I, I promised that I would pin this on him if the opportunity arose. He just remarked in passing that sometimes we learn the most from people who disagree with us. And David, I am, I'm going to put you right on the spot and ask you to expound on that thought a little bit. So go. Well, okay. Again, I'm gonna tell another story. Um, one of the more contentious things that we teach in science classrooms, particularly biology classrooms, is evolution. And I and a group of science educators were watching a film where um, the film followed the deliberations of some very thoughtful undergraduates as they went to college for the first time and were exposed to evolution. And at one point during the interviews, they had a chance to talk with the parents. And the parents said to the interviewer 
that they were really, really dismayed that their children were being taught evolution because, number one, they, they thought it was somehow in opposition to a, a, a faith point of view, which is not true. But second, the whole point of sending them to this particular school was that they wanted the experience to affirm the perspective that their parents had uh, schooled them in prior to going to college. And to my mind, that is a really impoverished point of view when it comes to what should be the result of a liberal arts education. And I do not mean for a moment that when p someone comes to a school like Western that these liberal faculty members are trying to convince you or to indoctrinate you to a particular perspective. No, 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 no. The point of a liberal arts education is for you to reflect upon why you believe what you do and critically examine it and consider other points of view. And if you leave college reaffirming the beliefs that you had, you're all the better. Amen. Exactly. I, I do not see that our goal is to change anybody's perspective, particularly about the big questions about why, why things are, are the case. So to my mind, that's the thing to consider is that to become a, a fuller, have a fuller understanding, you, you really need that. I could not agree more. Very, very well said. Maybe one piece I'll just add to that. One of my favorite verses in scripture is actually 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. And it, um, one, one translation of it says, um, test everything and then hold fast to what is beautiful. Um, a, lot, a lot of translations will say good, but, but actually the Greek word there uh, is often translated beautiful as well. Um, I just, I love that. I love that because there, there's, an, there's an encouragement to test everything. This is not about blind faith. This is not about someone somewhere said something so you better fall in line. Um, that's not the admonition, right? It's test everything. You're going to hear lots of things. It, did, it didn't say test some things and walk away from other things. It didn't say test some things and ignore other. It said test everything. Test everything because an unchallenged faith is, is per, maybe no, no real strong faith at all. So I, I love that encouragement to test everything. There's nothing to fear. <laughs> um, you know, perfect love drives out fear is another one of my favorite, favorite verses. So there's, there's nothing to fear here. Um, engage openly, honestly, test everything, right? That, that also demonstrates a humble spirit, right? A, a, a willingness to say, hey, I'm, I may not have every piece of everything here, right? Uh, because some of what I believe, however beautiful it is and however fast I'm holding to it, may be colored by my experiences, my biases, the finiteness of my body and mind in space, right? That, it's, that at least we all should be able to agree and have humility about and say, well, there's someone else from other spaces and other places. And that can only be enriching for me to engage that. Sometimes it'll challenge me to the point of, gosh, I, I think I've had a very myopic view. And other times it'll strengthen what it, it'll say, wow, that really speaks to the beauty that I thought I understood and now has been heightened as a result of being challenged that way a little bit, right? And to really be able to see things from, from that perspective too. So, yeah. One of the questions that I encourage my students to ask themselves is this one. Of course, as a philosophy professor, I get to do this to them, right? Uh, if I am wrong. How am I going to find out? And it's hard to ask yourself that question. Most of the time we like to bump along through life, not worrying about the possibility that we might be wrong about anything. So I guess just uh, as a follow up for each of our speakers, I'd like to say, um, what would you say to a student who says to you, okay, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. There are lots of ways of knowing I need to be able to learn a variety of perspectives, but Ultimately, then it comes down to me. When should I change my mind? Okay, so um, we have examples from this in science. And so let me draw your attention to the fact that while scientists claim to, to know an awful lot of things, by and large, if you look under the, the, the hood, so to speak, you'll see a whole bunch of people basically making a whole bunch of claims to authority, which is to say the biologists make claims about chemistry all the time. They rely upon those claims. and 
They do so recognizing that it's not their ballywick, it's not what they do research in, but they count on the chemistry community to have its act together when it comes to establishing claims about chemistry. And so to my mind, one thing to consider is that there are times when an appeal to authority is appropriate. And what I have faith in is not any particular claim that a scientist makes. What I have faith in is this peer review process by which claims are vetted by peers who do have that expertise. And so to my mind, there's something to be gleaned from that, that we don't have to master everything, but we do need to identify reliable sources of information. And so as much as the meaning of life might be something that truly is a challenge each and every one of us should take on uh, and, and pursue it throughout our lives, there are other claims where I think it's entirely appropriate to say, you know what, I'm going to defer to an authority when it comes to this. Like, for instance, I don't know, should I take a vaccine? A vaccine? I, I, I'm inclined to think that's precisely the sort of thing where you should feel comfortable if indeed an expert community advises you to do so. Yeah, somewhat similar to that. What I, what I would say um, is that even in science where people have this perception that we're dealing with cold, hard facts, right? Um, and, and we use this language in lay culture about proving this and proving that. That's generally not my experience as a scientist. Generally what we're doing is accumulating evidence in favor of one explanatory model over another, right? So you have some data, you have a phenomenon. Um, and, and when you start out, you know, if you don't really have a lot of a priori knowledge about it, you have a lot of different models. You have a lot of ways in which this could be explained, right? And it's fair, however silly some model might be, if you don't have a lot of data yet, I guess it's on the table, right? But then as you do experiments and as you accumulate data and information and you do complementary kinds of experiments, not the same kind of one over and over again, so you're getting validation, right? Um, over time, and across different ways of looking at the data, eventually what starts to happen is that you accrue right, evidence that, it, that suggests one explanatory model or one model is able to explain the data much more robustly than the other models. You can't be completely closed to the possibility that some of those other models may hold some kernels of truth in them, right? Um, but this model, and you may need to refine this model over time. Charles Darwin got a lot of it right, but he also didn't know a lot and got a lot of it wrong, right? And so in the intervening time, we've been working on a lot of that and really getting to a better and better sense of how that works. That's true with almost all kind of the, the biology that, that I do in, in, in our lab, for example, right? The reason why I'm going into all of that is because it, that was actually not so different from the way that I came to faith in college. Um, I, I actually I, I was a budding scientist and um, took that kind of an approach. I, I didn't, didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't really have uh, that background or that baggage, depending on how you see it, right? Um, and so it was a, flesh, a fresh kind of slate. Um, and so for me, it was, listen, there are, there's, there's data. There's the world around me. There's what I see. There's human history what is the explanatory model that people have come up with that seems to fit this data well, right? Is it none of them? Is it all of them? Do they all have a probability of zero? Do they all have a probability of something else? That's what really got me going on the journey. So in a, in a lot of ways, it was a very scientific process for me, right? But at some point, I had to take a leap of faith. This isn't something you prove scientifically, right? But I felt that I had gotten to a point where it was the best explanatory model, right? It's not unlike what C.S. Lewis said when he said, you know, I became a Christian not just because, when he said, you know, I believe in Christianity the way that I believe in the Son, not the Son of God, but the Son, right? Um, not just because I see it, perhaps not even because I can see it, because, you know, you probably shouldn't do that, but because by it I see all things, and the reason why I find that quote powerful is it's kind of akin to the way I came to the faith in that I was looking for an explanatory model, right? Um, so that, that's just to describe my journey, okay? But I, I share this just to, to say that 
I found it really interesting. I didn't realize I was doing it at the time, but I found it really interesting that I was using a very scientific process to get me to a certain point and then realized that experiential knowledge had to kick in. I was going to take a leap of faith here and see how my experiences in relationship and with intentionality were going to shape my commitments one way or the other. And I was open to any direction. They happened, I, I hope I was as open as I thought I was, and they happened to deepen my commitments, but I was totally open at that time for it taking me in the other direction. And so there, there's that continuum there with you know, more scientific, propositional, and then more experiential that I uh, went through. Thank you, uh, both David and Praveen. We are at the point where we rotate to questions from you guys. Somebody asks, uh, when bioethical decisions or decisions in medical treatment situations are made, what uh, moral or ethical standard or reference should they be made to? Can this type of morality or of ethics be subjective or is it objective? What, how, do you, how do you view that? Oh boy. Um, okay. I think the context is really important here because so often we make these uh, bioethical decisions in the context of either a research study or in the context of a tragic situation in a hospital, in which case you have to abide by the legal restrictions that guide these sorts of decisions. Um, oftentimes people uh, appeal to prevailing ethical norms. So depending upon the community, there may be different norms with regard to what uh, should be done. So this is yet another instance where there might be one right thing to do, but it'll be context dependent as opposed to something that we can say holds in all places and all times. Yes, I do agree with that. And let me also just affirm the question. This is a really, really important question. And in you know a, a country like ours, we, we, we need different voices at the table. We, we need to hear what people are thinking. Um, you know, genome editing uh, is is one of the ton of topics that's swirling around right now. It's a question I get a lot. And afterward, if you want to talk more about that, I'm happy to, because I do think about that particular one a little bit more than maybe some other kinds of ethical questions. Um, but I think that the, the first thing is we are doing a lot of things just because we can. I think uh, there's an issue there. I think we all need to recognize of diverse persuasions and worldviews, we need to recognize that that may not be in our best interests to just do something because we can. Uh, we've, because we have a lot of examples in history where that's burned us, right? So slowing down and bringing diverse opinions to the table so that we can hear one another has got to be the starting point, right? From there, I completely agree with David. There's not going to be one formula here, but I, I do feel like we can make a lot of progress if we're just willing to slow down. Uh, so, so that, I think, is, is a prerequisite to really being able to have the conversation about the ethics. It is very difficult. I know I'm, it's a bit of a cop-out in my answer here because I'm not giving you a, hey, you know, there might be a Christian at the table with really strong beliefs about, um, you know, what can, can or cannot be done or what playing God looks like. And there may be someone of a completely different uh, worldview or uh, doesn't feel like we need to be uh, you know, bringing that to the discussion whatsoever, how do you find common ground? Um, I don't think that's easy. But I, my concern is we're not even having those conversations. So maybe you ought to start having the conversations and see where they go. Um, the motto at Cornell right now is to do the greatest good. I even have a flag of it in my office. I like it. I want to do good. But the thing is, what does that mean? Right? And I was actually a part of the campaign and in the video for it and everything. And as a result, I got to talk to some of the higher level administrative leadership in the university. And I asked them the question, what, what does it mean to be good, to do the greatest good? And it was a lot of hand wringing and like, well, you know, it's like doing good, right? It's, we don't know how to, what does good even mean? We all have different views actually on what it means to be good or what it means to do good, right? And I think we all also feel like that definition comes from different places. It has a different source for some of us, right? But I was actually struck, despite that, I was struck by how we could still find a lot of common ground, right? So I might appeal to, well, you know, you know here, here's what I think is good, 
and and bring in a uh, you know Christian element to it and an element of when what does God mean when He says that something is good and how does that inform the way that I think about what's good for us to do? I have colleagues that are not going to think along those lines whatsoever, but it's my and their responsibility to come to the table and find common ground. You have to do that. Um, well, hi, thank you both for uh, talking. I, I absolutely loved it. Um, sort of my question centers around uh, this line that's been attempted to walk sort of between sort of a scientific approach towards towards knowledge of you know matters of religion or faith, et cetera, and then sort of more you know experiential things that are lived, um, you know the subjective aspect, which I, I think is a perfectly apt characterization of how you describe, say, people's relationship with the Bible. I, my worry then is that uh, it's actually the uh, sort of intense focus on the subjective aspect of that that seems to have it just be another form of scientific inquiry or investigation going on. Uh, for instance, uh, we have sort of taken out the peer review process in these kinds of faith kinds of claims, and now I am the sole arbiter of, you know, religious views, what the, what the Bible seems to me. Uh, and that might seem fine, but it also runs the risk of being sort of a watered down scientific process or, or peer review system. So how is there a way to um, actually sort of disentangle one's own, you know, personal subjective experience uh, with religion and, you know, sort of attempts to make knowledge claims in that domain uh, without losing um, sort of the actual efficacy that comes from the scientific method and just becoming sort of this watered down introspective version. Okay, so uh, I'm inclined to think that both of these judgments involve a community of some sort. So we have this formal process called peer review by which scientific claims are judged. And to my mind, when a group of people get together for a Bible study group and study the same issue, oftentimes there's an attempt to either reveal consensus or gain deeper understanding of disagreements that might be there. So to my mind, there is a process by which we do challenge one another's ideas even in you know, uh, from a religious standpoint or, or from an aesthetic standpoint. So to my mind, it doesn't necessarily have to be labeled as merely subjective. I still think that part of the goal is to come up with a compelling version that works not only for you, but your peers. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, the, the flip side, the problem with the community is sometimes you get into groupthink. And I've seen that happen both in religious communities and scientific non-religious communities. Not that they're mutually exclusive. Um, so you, you, you have to have accountability to be careful about that. But it's, a, it's absolutely right. In our very kind of rugged individualism, you know, go America kind of thing, we um, lose sight of the fact that a lot of this is meant to happen corporately and in community. Yeah. Um, and that, that's what this is supposed to be about too, right? It kind of goes back, I think it was a point, David, that you were making about uh, being intentional about putting yourself in environments where there are different ideas, right? You will necessarily be challenged, right? And it won't just be a constant affirmation of that of which you already believe. There's one other point to be made, which is historically there's always been a time where a pr perspective that we now think of as consensus was a minority opinion. So to my mind, there's a very active role for dissenting voices. And who knows, it could be your voice, your perspective that leads others t to adopt a similar posture. Hello, thank you. So I really enjoyed the talk. I really appreciate it. You guys started off with a discussion of what knowledge is and some insights into that. That's a question near and dear to my heart. I am curious if you guys could give some insights onto what exactly you mean by faith as well. That's a question which uh, a lot of different philosophers, or that's a word which a lot of philosophers, theologians use in a different uh, manner. You talk about faith as uh, something that can be tested, also something which is, you know, a leap in some sense. So I'm wondering what you guys mean exactly by faith, and furthermore, if you could give some insight onto how to test or verify that. Would you like to go first? No, you're welcome to. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I typically have thought of Faith is a synonym for belief, right? Which is to say, 
if we couch everything as I know something to be true, you're going to have the scientists leave the room as well as everybody else because we, none of us have access to some privileged way of discerning whether something is true or not. Scientists have a particular way in which they test their claims and to my mind it's the case that in other disciplines there are similar ways in which people test their perspectives. So in religion sometimes we go back to the Bible or another religious document to see whether the perspective that we're talking about conforms and whether there's justification within the text. Now the problem with a, a weighty book like the Bible is that sometimes it has contradictory passages and people place weight on different parts as a result of that. So for instance, um, sometimes Christians place a great deal of weight on the New Testament and they think that that frees them and there's very good biblical evidence that indeed this is a um, permissible interpretation that the New Testament frees us from some of the restrictions in the Old Testament. And as a consequence, they're willing to set aside some specific strictures in the Old Testament by virtue of their understanding of the documents as a whole and particularly the New Testament. I will say that to my mind, the Bible and other religious documents are a way to gain insights into how to get into heaven and not how the heavens were constructed. So to my mind, we run a little astray when we interpret the Bible as a scientific document or even a historical document, although I realize that there are many people who do argue that, in point of fact, it is a fairly historically accurate document. So, so typically, when people talk about faith, right, I, I think what they mean is that which can't be proven scientifically, okay? But, but I've already kind of told you that even within science, we're not necessarily in the business of proving, all right, as much as we are, um, you know, gaining uh, favor for one model over another as we accumulate data and information. And so sometimes it feels like we've proven something, right? But really we've just so much favor toward this one model relative to the other that we just say, we're gonna run with that, right? That, that just makes sense, right? Um, and, and honestly, that was a lot of my experience too, coming to what I, what I say is faith. Another example that I'll give is, this comes back to Pascal. Even in mathematics, he was a mathematician, right? He talked about this problem like when you prove a mathematical theorem, right? And he said, one statement has to be backed up by another statement, which has to be backed up by another statement and another statement and so But if you keep doing that, you have the problem of infinite regress. You just keep going and going and going, you never stop. So how do we stop in math? We just say at some point, well, look, we're, we're just gonna stop at some point and we're gonna call that an axiom or a postulate. And we're gonna all take it for granted that that's true because it's our shared experience, things like time and space. We don't actually know what causes time and space. There's all kinds of debates and interesting conversations, but it's shrouded in confusion. We, the way that, in a, in a way that gravity and heat and other things are not, right? And yet we, which of us, maybe some of us did walking into this room, but generally which of us is questioning that time exists? It's a shared experience that we all have and we would say that we know time, right? Even though we don't have a mechanistic underpinning for it per se, that's natural, right? Um, so I think even science has to wrestle and even scientists have to humbly accept and acknowledge that you know, all their reason, all my reasoning as a scientist is at some level based upon intuition. Right? It's based upon a sense that this is probably right, right? So there is some element of faith there, okay? Um, in the sense that it is not, like, I can't do more experiments to try to get a better understanding of what causes time, or, or at least to my knowledge, maybe there's some physicists uh, that can correct me on that. Um, and so there's a sense in which even there I'm operating by faith. And I don't actually... It, the, the, there are some qualitative differences with respect to that. That's a much more universally held position and shared experience, whereas you know, coming to faith in Christ or something is much less universally held. And I think it's important for me to be honest and clear about that distinction, but there's still something similar in it in my experience. Could I, could I just also interject that I think one might want to distinguish between 
science as a practice where we come up with tentative conclusions, say in the context of a particular study, and we don't know until later how that particular perspective or, 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 or research has been received by the community, which is to say, to some extent, these are retrospective decisions. With historical distance, we know that the community chose to, to identify this as fairly well confirmed, but you might not know it at the time. And I really doubt any of us, when we write dissertations or do theses, know at the time that we write whether we've done enough and whether we've established things sufficiently. And so this uh, awkwardness of not knowing is something that haunts any um, research activity. And you, you should just be aware of that, that you're probably not going to have the experience after doing a study, yeah, I got it right. Just in the name of adding as many diverse perspectives as we can, I'll throw one in here. Um, I like a metaphor that my friend Rick Matson uses when he says that faith is like skydiving. Um, Praveen reminded us that there are different words for these things. In the New Testament, the word that is used for faith is pistis, and pistis means trust. It's an act of trust, and trust can be well-placed or poorly placed, right? We all know people who are too gullible, and we all know people who trust people and things that they can and they should trust. But it's always trust in a case where you don't see the thing that you're trusting. Right? When I jump out of an airplane with a parachute packed on my back, if I didn't pack it with my own hands, then I had, by going out the door voluntarily, I am showing that I have faith in the person who packed that parachute because I'm venturing something on that. And if I am wrong, I am going to hit the ground at a velocity that is not going to be funny. So in, in the course of making life decisions, we venture on things. We trust things and then we act. And when we act, we sometimes act in ways where we care about the consequences and we can't control them any longer. It's out of our control. And I think that's a pretty good way of thinking at least about the word faith as I have come to use it. And as, as we've already seen, you know, words are used in different ways. So the, I guess the other thing I would say is when you're talking to somebody else and the person says the word faith, it's okay to say, tell me more about what you mean by that. It's okay to ask a question and have a conversation that starts that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and very quickly, what I'll say is that, that exactly what Tim said is one of the reasons I like First Thessalonians 5.21, test everything, right? And then, and then leap for that beauty. Right? So when there's, when there's a possibility of beauty, uh, as is my relationship with my wife, if I may say so myself, right? Um, I leapt for that, right? Did I know for 100% certainty? Like, did, was it told to me that I absolutely, no. You know, and if I were to try to explain or try to prove it to someone, all I'd really be do doing is relating a bunch of stories. And those stories would either be convincing or not, right? But at the end of the day, I had to look at that collection of stories and say, do I think there's a chance for truth and beauty here? And I, I, I said yes, and I leapt, right? And, and, and our marriage since then is the beautiful consequence of that. But that, that, that's the way that I think about faith, right? Is it's not blind, it's not with no information at all, it's not just like, that's chaos, right? Not faith. I mentioned Pascal, and he said something, and I'm probably going to misquote him, so maybe you can correct me, but he said the path to peace is found in the search for truth. I don't know, I'm close on that. But, um, and so that I think for each of us here, and this isn't for a mini sermon, but I think for each of us here as we are seeking for answers and seeking for peace in the regard of our quest, uh, it's important for us to remember how ugly we are when we think we're right. And the more we assume that we're right, the uglier we get. And that usually causes those that we're having a discourse with to close their ears. And the conversation's over. Opinion. Is there a place for the Bible in the sciences? Uh, d depends on what you mean by that exactly. So when I'm in the lab doing an experiment, I ought to be doing it in the way that empirical science has established is the right protocol for doing it, right? So uh, let's, you know, 
let's say a scientist believes in the Holy Spirit, okay? Um, but I, I don't think it's an appropriate way to do science to sit at the bench and wait for the Holy Spirit to move you, to move the pipette in a certain direction or this way or that. That, that, that I don't think that's an appropriate way to do science, right? So and if the question is interpreted that way, um, I, that, then I would say no, right? Uh, but if the question is interpreted in, an, in a different way, um, like for example, um, you know, my, some discoveries that have made have led me to worship, right? And uh, some people have said that it's kind of like the science lab is a cathedral for them, right? Because Kepler, we talked about over dinner, um, one of the really cool things he says is, all I, th all I think I'm doing, Johannes Kepler, all I think I'm doing is sort of figuring out the mind of God, like, no, like figuring things out that God has all already done and knows. And then I get to celebrate that with everybody. That, that's really all that I'm doing. You can call me a physicist or you can call me this or that, but that's who I think I am, right? Um, that's pretty cool. And uh, sometimes I think about my work that way, right? That, it, that there's, there's some new, I'm just scratching at the surface of knowledge and there's something unexpected, something beautiful. And it's like, wow. That is really cool, right? And that instinct to want to worship comes because I've developed, you know, a relationship with God that was based on the Bible, et cetera. And other people may have it through other means, but that's, that's my experience. Um, so there is a connection there between, uh, you know, the, the Bible and science, right? Um, there's a famous uh, writer, Sarah Williams. She's a poet, actually, an American poet. She said, I have loved the stars too fondly to be fearful of the night. Oh, I love that. Um, for so many reasons, but one of which is that this, this notion that perfect love drives out fear, which to me comes from scripture, right? um, that allows me to probe the depths of things without being afraid, right? Um, and to just be in awe about the things that I'm going to discover without having some preconceived notion of what that will be, right? So that's another connection between the way that I think about my faith and my relationship with God and the way that I do science. Hopefully that was helpful or hit anything you were looking for. <laughs> a, a couple of points. Um, according to contemporary scientists, we typically do not judge scientific claims with reference to their consistency with the Bible. But this hasn't always been the truth. So Galileo is particularly famous for ha having claimed we have two books to consult and they need to be consult consulted in conjunction with one another, the book of nature and the book of revealed truth. Mm -hmm. So that is a perspective that people have taken to the past on these issues. I will say that I, it seems to me that someone of faith can think that it's God's purpose for him or her to become a scientist, to engage in the prospect of being a good steward of the earth by, for instance, confronting the danger that is climate change. So to my mind, one can see the task of a scientist as fulfilling God's purpose for him or her. Thank you. Um, I have a simple question. I think it's simple. Um, how do you define truth? And how do you get to the truth? Uh, based on which standard would you say that something is true? Because I think, personally, whether we talk about knowledge, uh, faith, um, I think deep down, we all, all the belief that we might have, uh, even the knowledge, as I said, we might have those belief and knowledge because we believe that they are true, right? So even I think one of the questions that uh, um, Professor Magru asked is, um, if I'm wrong, like, I don't remember how you put it, but if I'm wrong, how, uh, how do I know it? How, how, yeah. But based on what you would say that you're wrong, how do you know that you're wrong? You see? So I, I'm just wondering, how do you define truth? How do you get to the truth based on which standard we say it's, uh, something's true? Start out with a scientist typically dispense with this idea of truth thanks to the work of philosophers. It's a, very pro it's a very problematic concept, which is to say we do not have access to truth and we have no way of knowing whether indeed a particular claim is true or not. So what we 
use instead is what one might be called uh, empirical adequacy. Um, it fits the available evidence and fits within our current interpretive framework. That's distinct from knowing whether or not something is true. Now, there's a very famous philosopher of science by the name of Karl Popper who drew our attention precisely to the fact that while we can never confirm that something's true, we can disconfirm something that is false. So he portrayed the entire process of science as attempts to falsify. This is his doctrine of falsification, that what scientists do in their theories and in their reasoning is try to find situations where a particular prediction turns out to be false and then test it that way because that's a genuine test of it. And if it is not falsified, that gives us more faith that indeed what we're doing is, is adequate. But in contrast, if indeed the, the, te the, the theory fails the test, then we know it's wrong. So this sort of cynical perspective one might take is there's no such thing as confirmation. All we can do is falsify things. I actually heard two questions there. And so with Praveen's permission, I'm going to just jump in and uh, try to say something very quickly about both. And then I know many of us would love to continue the conversation after. So if you want to follow up on questions, that's OK. I, I'll hang around. I have to lock the door at the end anyway. So, But there's, there's a question of the definition of truth. And then there's a question about the discovery of truth. So there's a very old definition. In principle, it goes actually back to the Greek philosopher Aristotle that says that to speak the truth is to say of what is that it is, and of what is not, that it is not. It's a very simple expression of what is sometimes called a correspondence theory of truth. Now, that's a definition. A definition isn't the same thing as a discovery or a test. So that may be what the truth is, and I may be wandering in darkness trying to figure out which thing is the way that it is. Right? I may know that, yeah, okay, fine, to say the truth would be to say of what is that it is, but I'm not sure really what's, what the truth is in a particular case. And there are a lot of methods that we use. One of the things that I have heard in what both David and Praveen have been saying is that the convergence of multiple lines of evidence is something that tends to convince not only individuals, but communities. And so when you see not just one piece of evidence pointing in a direction, but a whole body of evidence that's very hard to explain in any other way, that convergence is, well, you know, what would Sherlock Holmes call it? It's a set of clues. And clues are very valuable. And so that's the direction that I would go on. I'd split the question into two. What is the definition? And then what are the methods of discovery? And I'd, I would point to a cumulative case of multiple pieces of evidence as a really good clue. Just one quick piece to that and kind of bring it full circle. So we started, uh, at least I started my remarks talking about other languages and cultures and what we can learn from those. Um, in, in ancient Egyptian, the, the word for truth is mat. Um, and the best way to think about the definition of that is like that which holds everything together. I mean, that, this is like an unbelievable concept. I can barely wrap my head around that concept, much less thinking about actually being able to grasp all of it, right? Or in Hebrew, it's, it's emet, and it's uh, the, the first and the middle and the last letter of the alphabet. It would been, people have inferred from that that it suggests it's everything. It's everything that you see. It's everything that you don't see that is, that is right, as Aristotle would say. Um, so, I think the first step is to recognize that we are probably, no one person here is going to know the full truth. I think that, that, that discovery is in parts and pieces, right? And, and that's why we, we, we think of it as a journey, right? And I'll just share a personal element here, and that is um, when, when Jesus is before Pontius Pilate, um, Pontius asks him a bunch of questions and he answers. But then there comes a question, and he says, truth, what is truth, Pontius says, right? Quid est veritas? And there's no recorded answer. 
it's like it's like Jesus just stares at him. I like to imagine him saying, "You're looking at it, right?" Um, and whether you're a Christian or not, I think that's that that, par- that that story there is really powerful in that that helps me as a Christian to see the truth as a person. And what's interesting about that is like th- that you can't pin that down. Like you can't even pin me and you down, much less if God really appeared in the flesh, right, and said, "I'm truth." Right? So. Um, that, that just reminds me, I, I have no monopoly on truth. I, 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 I'm never going to fully grasp it it's in its entirety, but that I am on a journey toward bar- parts and pieces of it, as Paul would say, I see dimly on this side.